King, comfort of the spirit, mm -hmm. and the of our President, for us all, famous mm -hmm. treasure, blessings, and giver of life. Come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls with it. All right. So, who wants to uh, to read First Peter chapter two? <clears throat> so put away all malice, all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Oh, I like that. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourself, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, for it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Okay, okay keep going. I, I, I seem to have lost my place. Okay, right so, here. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumbled because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Behold, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct amongst the Gentiles honorable so that they may speak against you as evildoers. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject to the Lord, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but as living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants be subject to your masters, with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if you sin when you are beaten for it, you endure. But if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ has suffered for you, leaving you as an example so that you might follow his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, and you have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Okay. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> So basically the, the thought continues from chapter one, um, having purified your souls uh, by your obedience to the truth for a sin sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you've been born again, not a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God for all flesh is like grass and its glory like the flower of grass. grass. Grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So he says, so therefore put, a, put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. In other words, everything that's contrary to the word of God that was preached. Um, and it's not just about, you know, this is not about doctrines. It's not about, um, this, is, this is about 
Um, it's not about what we think, it's about how we live. And the gospel is about how we live. You know, we make a big deal about, you know, all of these fine points of doctrine and all of this kind of stuff, especially as catechumens. Um, we're in catechesis and and granted that uh, it's important, but what's even more important is how we live. Um, do we do we harbor malice and do we and are we deceitful and hypocritical and envious and do we slander um these all of these things are what is precisely contrary to the gospel so it doesn't really matter if your doctrine is is purely orthodox you know is that you're the great beacon of of orthodox truth if you don't live the truth you are uh betraying the truth this is very important because orthodoxy is about living the truth, not about um, how we, uh, uh, not about, not simply about doctrine. Um, like newborn infants long for, we should long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. What is that pure spiritual milk? It's the, um, it's this, you know, this commitment to living a pure and righteous and holy life. Um, uh, it's the, um, it's, it's not, it's not just the good news that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but do we live like Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do we live as if we're um, sons and daughters of God, um, or do we live um, uh, according to the passions and the lusts of our own hearts? And all of these are all passions and lusts. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Um, and that's the way of the world. Um, so we, as newborn infants, we should long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. If we have tasted that the Lord is good, how can we live according to all of these things? As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, for it stands in scripture. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a, a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. <clears throat> so it's this image of the church as um, and uh, as the body of Christ as the of the church as being made up of living stones um, uh, being built up into a spiritual house into a spiritual temple um, uh, and as a royal and as a holy priesthood um, so that we might offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In other words, um, we are who who we are, who we, what our real um, mission is in life is to be uh, transformed and to be built into that spiritual temple, um, to and to be a holy priesthood, sharing the priesthood of Christ in Him and through Him offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Um, you know, throughout our liturgy, we talk about a spiritual and unbloody sacrifice. Well, we offer that um, as the Eucharist. We offer the bread and wine of the Eucharist as our, as the, as our sacrifice, and it returns to us as uh, his body and blood, thus enabling us to uh, fulfill that calling, that identity, to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, um, a, a living temple, uh, spiritual stones that build up that temple, and uh, and to actual and to actualize being the body of Christ. <clears throat> um, so from where from Isaiah 28 he says behold I am laying a stone 
laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Thus, the emphasis is that Jesus Christ is that is that chosen and precious cornerstone um, who is the focus of our faith. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. In other words, so the honor is for you who believe, in other words, who believe in Christ, but for those who do not believe, namely the Jews, the stone which the builders, being the Jews, rejected because they rejected Christ has become the cornerstone. And not only the cornerstone, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. You know, Jesus was Jesus was rejected by the Jews. He was he was cast off and, and ultimately murdered. Um, and yet he is the cornerstone of the church. He is the cornerstone of our salvation. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Um, I think it's uh, and it, this the whole question of of predestination here. I mean, is is that is is this a predestination? Uh, from which they uh, could not escape, or was it one? A was it a an aspect of um, that they were uh, willing? They willingly cooperated with. Um, so what? What is that? I think um, the deco. I was going to say with this, with that. I feel like. It wasn't, I think it was more of a prophecy. Like if you are choosing to be, um, the say with being a Jew, this is going to potentially be the outcome. Mm -hmm. That's what right. I, that's more, that's what I'll say. It's more of like a prophecy. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's look at the, uh, um, the fathers. Didymus the blind. He was a great teacher of the, of the Syriac church. Just as the Lord is the true light who has come into the world for judgment, so that at his coming he may give sight to the blind and blind those who see in the wrong way. So he is also a chosen cornerstone, giving honor to those who join themselves to him in faith and revealing himself to them as a reliable foundation. But to those who do not believe, he is not precious, but a stone of stumbling and rock of offense, considered worthless by the builders who have rejected him. These builders are the scribes and the Pharisees. Chrysostom. These words refer to Christ, who himself prophesied in the gospel, saying, Have you not read the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. Pillar of Arl. Those of you who believe in Christ are more than just stones. You are sons of God. And bead. Um, just as those who refused to make Christ the foundation of their heart, in effect, condemned him by their actions, so too will they be condemned by him when he comes again. For then he will be unwilling to receive those who rejected him into his house, which is the heavens. Um, and let's look here at uh, Didymus. Their own unwillingness. The position in which they find themselves is one which they have chosen, for it starts with their unbelief. For just as the world which has been placed under evil uh, is not evil by nature, but has attained this position by its own desire. So also those who are being talked about here have been so placed because of their own unwillingness to believe, for they are cousins of those who have been handed over to the wickedness of their desires. For God was very patient with those who despised his goodness and mercy, but in, in the end he left them to follow their own will. This is, this is really, you know, um, one of the, one of the questions um, I would have um, on this word, uh, let's see here. Um, Hmm. 
is this concept of they were destined to do it. It makes it sound like they um, they uh, they have no um, uh, they have no will of their own. But I think that's I don't think that that's quite correct. Um, let's see. Trying to figure this out. Um, search. Hmm. Well, this is not. I uh, can't figure that out. Anyway, so I think it's it's very important that we understand this not as they stumbled because they disobeyed the word, um, which is not that they were destined, which is passive, but as they willed to do. Essentially, they chose to do. So, but you are a chosen race. Okay. Um, let's see. Genos, chosen race. A call, uh, here again, chosen is not the right word. It's called, eclectos. You see it down there in the bottom? Um, somebody, so it's, a, it's a race that has been called by God, a people that has been called by God. Um, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is, this is, um, this is really important. Um, when Christ, the salvation that Christ has given to us makes us, unites us with himself so that we share his priesthood, uh, we, and we have become a holy nation, a holy people. A uh, people, a uh, people uh, of his own possession. Um, in other words, it's not the Jews who are a chosen people. They were a called people, but they rejected the call. It's now those who are a a, a new chosen race, not by uh, ethnicity, but by faith. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Of course, um, this is uh, this is um, re referring, of course, to Christ, because it is he who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So as, a, as, as the called race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. Um, we need to proclaim that um, the excellencies, the uh, the goodness, um, for those who uh, went to St. Herman's, the word is arati, which is the name of one of our um, old parishioners in Greece. Um, uh, the name of him who called you out of darkness. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, we're to become a Christian. Uh, to be a Christian is that we are um, incorporated into Christ. Incorporated, in other words, embodied in Christ. Um, uh, We were not a people. 
Um, we're just, you know, random people from many different um, races and ethnicities and languages and colors, but now you are God's people. And this, is, this, this, I think, is so important because one of the biggest uh, temptations, I think, in the Orthodox world is to think that um, uh, the chosen people is the Russians or the Greeks or the Serbs or the Arabs or whoever. But it's not. It's it's those it's who have some kind of earthly identity. But rather, our identity is from the gospel. Um, and and from our faith in Jesus Christ. Once you had not received mercy, as before we were Christians, but now you have received mercy from from God be, through faith. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which war against your soul. One of the things in the scriptures that is um, so important throughout the, uh, uh, especially in the New Testament, um, is, is the absolute emphasis on chastity. You know, that we must never, ever allow ourselves to capitulate to the passions of the flesh. Um, because the, the flesh wars against the soul. St. Paul talks about that. Um, and as when we um, when we when we let ourselves be um, conquered by the passions of the flesh, um, we're not living according to Christ. We're living according to the world. We're li living according to the fall and not according to our resurrection. In fact, it's a denial, as it were, of the resurrection. Um, and that chastity is, uh, uh, it's a, uh, or fleshliness, sarkikos. Um, uh, actually, the word is not passions, it's the lusts of the flesh, epithemia. Um, uh, I think I think we all probably realize how how those how the fleshly passions uh, distract us and pull us away um, from living spiritual lives. Um, we get caught up in a pattern of of gratification and then demoralization and depression and then on and on and on. Of course, in this context. Um, Peter was probably writing against the uh, uh, against those who would go to the temples to visit the temple prostitutes and and things like that, and as well as other kinds of fornication. Um, my guess is he's also uh, in this is a kind of a hidden uh, agenda to uh, against the Gnostics who were. Uh, lascivious um, in their practice, had no value of, to chastity. Um, but the mark of Christianity is chastity. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Um, so let's what, look. Let's what look is at. meant by the day of visitation? Well, that's a good question. Um, but I think it's the day of it's the day of the Lord. Okay. Uh, when when he when he returns. Uh, let's look here at Didymus. Under the old dispensation, the priesthood and the kingship were two different things. No one could be both a king and a priest except the uh, the descendants of David. But afterwards came the gospel, which united these two offices in Christ. From this it follows that the people whom he has chosen will be both royal and priestly at the same time. Some people wonder how it is possible, seeing that we are called from all the nations on earth, 
for us to be regarded as one holy people. The answer to this is that although we are from many different nations, the fact that we have all repented of our sins and accepted a common will and a common mind uh, gives those who have repented one doctrine and one faith. When there is a soul and heart common to all believers, then they are called one people. Uh, Augustine notes, in ancient times, only one high priest was anointed, but now all Christians are anointed. Um, and Leo, all, all who have been born again in Christ are made kings by the sign of the cross and consecrated priests by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Um, let's look at origin. O people of God, chosen to expound the virtues of the Lord, take up the circumcision worthy of the word of God in your ears, on your lips, in your heart, and in the foreskin of your flesh, as well as in every part of you. Interesting. This is 210. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Um, Didymus here. This verse means that Gentiles who were not God's people before they believed have now been called by him and have come to him. Some people think that Peter is talking about a mixture of beings who are both good and bad by nature, but their interpretation comes up against many serious objections. You cannot say of spiritual beings that there was once a time when they were not a people and when they lacked mercy, nor can you say of earthly beings that they have been turned into a people and received mercy. Therefore, I believe that this is the wrong interpretation of that verse. I think verse 12 is rather um, Okay, let's let's look at uh, Augustine here. God's people occupy the middle ground. They are to be compared neither with those who think that the only good is to enjoy earthly delights, nor with those sublime inhabitants of heaven whose sole delight is the heavenly bread by which they were created. Between the people of heaven and those of earth, the apostle was suspended in the middle, heading towards heaven. Though he was not yet there, but at the same time separated from the others here below. Um, Hilary of Arles. Evil desires are called carnal because they operate through the flesh, but in reality they're spiritual because they come from the soul. They're sp spiritual, but not noetic. Um, Twelve. Um, Let's look at Hillary. The day of visitation will be like the time when God visited Egypt uh, through an angel and slew all the firstborn children. Similarly, he will visit the lands of the earth and will cut off the first fruits of all evil works. It's interesting. Um, I think basically what it means is is that our conduct um, uh, should be honorable among the the Gentiles, um, that even though they speak against us as evildoers, um, uh, to condemn the faith, they may see our good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. Um, I think there's some kind of um, myth going on. Um, in that comment um, by Didymus. Anyway, are there any questions so far? No questions? Okay. Do, 
213. Um, be subject to the Lord, for be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Um, uh, the actual word is thesis, which is creation. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him, to punish those who do evil, and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So, there's doesn't sound like civil disobedience is uh, is exactly a uh, something strongly re recommended by Saint Peter. Um, be subject to every human institution, to the emperor, uh, and this is important, or the or the king Vasilevs, um, as supreme. Um, or to governors, and the point of and the point of these these institutions of uh, kings and governors is to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Um, for it is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. You know, the tr Christians were accused of all sorts of things at that time, all sorts of evil. And uh, and so so we should you know we we should silence their objection not by violence or any kind of anything else but by but by doing good and by being obedient we might put put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So is he talking about Biden? The emperor? I guess so. Oh, well. Or Adolf Hitler or... Lenin? Any Anybody else or Pierre Trudeau? That's a tough one. Well, I'll say. <laughs> My poor country. Yeah. Peter. I was just going to say that today is the commemoration of St. Philip of Moscow. So um I'm sure he didn't dishonor the emperor, but he did actually disagree with the emperor and he suffered for his righteous sort of um, disagree, his, his, his attempt to correct Ivan the Terrible. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's it's quite a story. Um. So, you know, but what what is you know what Saint Peter is talking about is is to live honorably and peacefully, and you know, give honor to whom honor is good, honor is due, fear God, to whom fear is due, all, and uh, honor everyone. So servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. This is there's actually a uh, get this. Um, this essentially means household servants. Be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. This is a really important um, principle in the Christian life. You know, people get all upset about. Uh, being disrespected and you know and all of that kind of thing but we but it's a gracious thing he says when mindful of god one endures sorrows 
while suffering unjustly. This is this is this of course is totally not of this world. Because what do we do when we how often do you, we we get angry and we complain and we object and we protest and and take people to court when we feel like we've been uh, dishonored or or disrespected. But he says it is a gracious thing. In other words, it conveys grace when um, mindful of God. We endure sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Because why? Because we liken ourselves to Christ. Because this is exactly what he did. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. In other words, the ultimate judgment is of God. That's the only one we need to worry about, no matter what, no, no matter how other people treat us. Um, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, the cross, um, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. He bore our sins in his body. In other words, he took our sins upon himself and in, um, and in dying, he destroyed our sins. He overcame our sins so that we might die to sin in baptism and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed because it is our sins that wound him. And yet his death and resurrection is the thing that ultimately expiates those sins. For you were straying like sheep, but now return to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Word is Episcopos, bishop. This is a Protestant translation. So, so the basic sum, summary of it is that we should we should emulate Christ, accepting to uh, suffer unjustly, to be reviled and persecuted and rejected and and slandered because when we endure it we liken ourselves to Christ this was this is definitely politically incorrect in the 21st century So shall we get into chapter three? Somebody want to somebody want to read three? Starting there. Come on, we got to have somebody. <coughs> Okay. No. Okay. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which, is, which in God's sight is very precious. 
for this is how the holy woman who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a, bless a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that be God's will, and for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he, may, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into the heavens and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Okay. So this is this is not only about likening ourselves to Christ, but being obedient to Him as well. And then, um, starting here, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. In other words. Peter and Paul were pretty much on the same line, on the same page. Be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one. In other words, if some, um, uh, I assume that refers to husbands, do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. In other words, the the wife can sanctify the unbelie the believing wife can sanctify the unbelieving husband, and it's not it's not by preaching and and nagging him uh, to come to church, but rather to um, uh, to conduct themselves um, uh, uh, quietly, um, uh, showing respect and honor to their husbands. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing that you wear. Now, this actually is uh, is a reference to the book of Enoch, um, in which the fallen angels um, taught the, among other things, um, uh, cosmetics, 
um, uh, adornment, you know, with uh, jewelry and and the making of jewelry and and hairstyles and all of that kind of thing. Um, that was uh, that's uh, the fallen angels came and taught men these uh, these things. Um, so it's not about it's not about external adornment. But let your adornment be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of it. And uh, just because somebody has all has all sorts of uh, it's external adornment and jewelry and you know and fine clothing and things doesn't mean that they're uh, uh, a good person in their heart, but rather the true person uh, is not is not the one that is is trying to be showy and and um, uh, you know exhibiting their their wealth and their power, but but rather um, with this is beautiful the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit and truly this is this is precious in god's sight this is how the holy women who hoped in god used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as sarah obeyed abraham calling him lord and if you are her children if you do good and do not fear any anything that is frightening in other words, complete trust in God, uh, doing uh, doing good, which is by definition the will of God, and not fearing anything, um, uh, because ultimately when we are uh, in Christ, when we are united in Christ, there's nothing that can frighten us. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Um, the word is in gnosis. Uh, live, your, live with your wives in um, in knowledge, um, but not just an ex, not just an external knowledge, but a but a profound spiritual knowledge, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. In other words. Husbands and wives need to honor and respect one another. Um, and especially in in relation, um, you know, recognizing that uh, that women are um, are not as physically strong and uh, as men, um, but together, uh, the wife is given to the husband uh, to share that they'd be co-heirs of the grace of life in other words uh the raising of families the raising of children so that your prayers may not be hindered <laughs> finally all of you have unity of mind homo uh, sympathy um that's the greek word is sympathes but um that also means compassion unity of mind compassion philadelphia brotherly love a tender heart uh, of splagnos. Um, if you've uh, the uh, it actually isn't referring to the heart; it's referring to the to the innards, um, which in the ancient world was the uh, the way of expressing that kind of uh, tenderness of heart. So this is translated culturally translated, and a humble mind. Unity of mind, compassion, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. And who can who can fight against that, right? Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling. You know, so much of our culture is based on on retribution, uh, where uh, evil is uh, repaid with evil, and 
um, you know, and it seems like we have no qualms about, um, you know, slandering and, and reviling one another. But on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. And then this wonderful little passage from uh, Psalm 30, 30, 33, 34. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. This is, a, this is, I think, a very important thing. Um, we have nothing to fear from anyone. What can, what can they do to us, ultimately? Take away our possessions, yes. Take away our money, yes. Uh, take away our freedom, yes. Kill our body, yes. Does that kill the soul? No. Because they can't, they have no... There's nothing that they can do to us that will be um, that would hurt our souls. But even if you should suffer righteousness or suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. And and the only way to do this is if in our hearts we honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense. To anyone who asks for a reason for that hope that is in us. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We all need to be able to uh, uh, talk about our faith to non-believers. We ought to be able, we need to be able to um, uh, proclaim to with with in a spirit of gentleness and respect, proclaim to them what the gospel is. So I was talking with somebody recently, and they said, "I bet no, I bet there are very few people who are Orthodox who can who can tell you what is the what is the gospel." You know, they, they talk about an elevator sermon. You know, the the length of time it takes an elevator to go from the bottom to the top, or from the top to the bottom. Um, what is the message of the gospel? That's something I think we should think about. Because what it is, it's not, we're not trying to convert them to a, um, you know, a, a certain ideology. What we're trying to bring people to is to the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. Um, which is witnessed to by a life lived in humility. Fearlessness, yes, but humility. And always in a spirit of gentleness and respect. Unfortunately, uh, many, of, uh, many of the young uh, internet warriors who are so, um, carried away with you know with with their arguments uh there is no gentleness respect or humility it's truly terrible yeah it's awful and what does it do it turns people away from the faith because who needs that and it's just arrogance part of it's just the arrogance of youth and part of it's um the sinful passion. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. 
So when we when we tell people about Christ and why why we believe in Christ and why we commit ourselves to Christ, um, uh, it has to be with gentleness and respect, and so, and preserving a good conscience. You know that we haven't gone too far, that we haven't been disrespectful, that we haven't been critical, that we haven't been judgment judgmental and slanderous. But having a good conscience, so that when we are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. If we suffer for doing evil, then we, we probably deserve it. But if we suffer for doing good, then we liken ourselves to Christ. One last paragraph here. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, So Christ also suffered once for sins in, in the crucifixion. He is the righteous one who suffered for the sake of the unrighteous, for the sake of uh, to redeem the sinners, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh and thus um, doing away with uh, doing away with the sins um, but made a lot being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison this is this is a, an important line um that uh during the time that Christ was in the tomb, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in, in Hades. Um, uh, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. In other words, those who were in prison, you know, some from uh, the time of Noah and who were destroyed in the in the flood um, because they did not obey God when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. I think the Protestants probably don't like this at all. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because when we're baptized, it's not just a bath, but rather it's a it's it's dying and, and rising with Christ and entering into the resurrection um, of Jesus Christ, um, dying to the old man, being raised to the new, um, that we might, uh, that as an appeal to God for a good conscience, in other words, to be transformed through the font, baptismal font by the remission of our sins. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, powers having been subjected to him. Um, this is this is also a very, I think, a very important thing. Um, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is seated and is at the right hand of God, and right hand of the Father, with angels. In other words, 
Um, Christ has ascended into heaven and is co-enthroned with the Father and the Spirit, um, uh, surrounded by the angels' authorities, powers, and this is and this is what we talk about. This the, this is the content of the prayers of the liturgy. In other words, what this is, it's it's a, there's a liturgical vision here of the ascent to the throne of God in His kingdom. So, so this this should be interesting, Augustine. The question which you put to me about the spirits in hell is one which disturbs me profoundly. What troubles me most is why only those who were imprisoned in the days of Noah should deserve this benefit. Think of all the others who have died since Noah's time and whom Jesus uh, could have found in hell. <clears throat> the meaning must be that the Ark of Noah is a picture of the church. And so those who were imprisoned in his days represent the entire human race. In hell, Christ rebuked the wicked and consoled the good so that some believe to their salvation and others disbelieve to their damnation. Um, B, by pointing out that only eight people were saved from the flood, Peter reminds us that in comparison to the large number of Jews, heretics and unbelievers, uh, uh, which there are in the world, which there are in the world, the number of God's chosen ones is very small. As Jesus said, the gate is narrow and the way that is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. St. Cyprian. Peter showed and vindicated the unity of the church by commanding and warning that we can be saved only through the baptism of the one church. Just as in that baptism of the world by which the ancient iniquity was purged, the one who was not in the ark could not be saved through water. So now anyone who has not been baptized in the church cannot be saved, for the church has been founded in the unity of the Lord as a sacrament of the one ark. Didymus. Just as all rational creatures are made by the Son of God, who is the word or reason, so too is their salvation brought about by him. For those who possess holiness, not by nature, but by grace, because they are creatures, must be cleansed by him in order to obtain goodness. So, and then Leo the Great, while the strength of the angelic legions that waited on Christ was held in check, he drank the cup of sorrow and death thereby transforming the entire affliction into triumph. Deceptions were overcome and the powers of evil were suppressed. So. So, I think that's it for tonight. Are there any questions, comments? On the whole, this is very straightforward, so it's not like it's... You know. All right. So God willing, we'll meet next week.
on what is that March or February 1st? No. Can it be February already? January the no. 30th. January 30th. Okay. So. All right. Well, let's pray. They, thou hast appeared to the universe, and thy light, O Lord, has shown on us. Who with understanding praise thee, thou hast come, thou hast revealed thyself. O light unapproachable. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind. Always now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you. God bless you.